This is an excerpt from the Notebooks of Malt Lord's Brig by Rainier Marie Rilke, narrated by Joseph Vobel. It must have been before my time when people knew, really knew, how to tell a story. I've never heard anyone telling one. Every time Abalone spoke to me about Mama's youth, it was clear she couldn't narrate. Old Count Brahe could, though. I want to write down what she said about that. There must have been a period in Abalone's young life when her own emotionality was far from confined. That was when the Brahes lived in town in the Bredgadi and did a fair amount of entertaining. When she went up to her room late in the evening, she would think she was tired like the others, but then all at once she would feel the window, and, if I've understood rightly, she could stand facing the night for hours on end, thinking, this is about me. I stood there like a prisoner, she said, and the stars were freedom. Then she had no difficulty going to sleep. The expression to fall asleep ill matches this year of her girlhood. Sleep was something that rose with you, and from time to time you opened your eyes and lay on a new surface that was still far from being the topmost one, and then you were up before daybreak, even in winter when the others would come sleepily and late to breakfast. Of an evening when it grew dark, there were always only candles for the whole household, candles for sharing. But the two candles that were lit very early in the new darkness, giving everything a fresh start, those candles you had to yourself. They stood in their low two-branched candlestick and shone peacefully through the small, oval, tall lampshades painted with roses that now and then had to be reset. That didn't disturb anything. For one thing, you were in no hurry whatsoever, and for another, there were the times you needed for looking upwards and reflecting when you were writing a letter or making an entry in the diary you'd started when your handwriting was completely different, timid, beautiful. Count Brahe lived quite separate from his daughters. He considered it sheer delusion when anyone claimed to be sharing their lives with others. Sharing, you say, he would remark but he didn't find it unwelcome to hear people talking of his daughters. He would listen attentively as if they lived in a different town. It was then quite extraordinary when one morning after breakfast he beckoned Abalone to him. We have some habits, it seems. I too write very early in the morning. You can help me. Abalone remembered it as if it were yesterday. The very next morning, she was led into her father's reputedly inaccessible study. She didn't have time to take a close look at the room as she was immediately given a seat facing the count across from his writing table, which seemed to her like a plane of books and piles of paper as villages. The count dictated. Those who maintain that Count Brahe was writing his memoirs weren't entirely wrong. Only these didn't deal with his political and military reminiscences that were eagerly awaited. I forget them, the old gentleman would say curtly when anyone dropped a hint in that direction. But what he didn't want to forget was his childhood. He held on to it, and in his way of thinking, it was quite in order for his very distant past to have control of him now, and for him to turn his gaze inward where it lay as in a northern summer night intensified and unsleeping. Sometimes he would spring to his feet and speak into the candle flames, causing them to flicker, or he would order whole sentences to be crossed out yet again. Then he would pace violently up and down, his Nile green silk dressing gown billowing. Throughout all this, there was one other person present, Sten, the Count's old Jutlander valet, whose job it was when Grandfather jumped up, was to put his hands on top of the loose sheets of paper covered with notes that lay around on the desk. His grace entertained the notion that modern paper was worthless, being much too light so that, given the least opportunity, it would fly away. And Sten, whose long upper half was all you saw of him, shared this distrust and appeared to sit on his hands, blind in daylight and solemn as an owl. This Stan spent his afternoons reading Swedenborg, and none of the other servants would ever have cared to go into his room because, so it was said, he was in communion with the dead. Sten's family had always sought contact with spirits, and Sten had been marked out for this kind of communication. 
His mother had seen an apparition the night she gave birth to him. Sten had big round eyes, and the other end of his vision lay behind the person he was looking at. Abalone's father often asked after spirits the same way you'd ask after relatives. Are they coming, Sten? He would ask kindly. It's good if they come. For a few days the dictation continued, but then Abalone couldn't spell Eckernford. It was a proper noun, but she'd never heard it before. The Count, who, truth to tell, had been looking quite some time for an excuse to abandon the writing, which was too slow for his memories, made out he was loath to continue. She can't write it, he said harshly, and others won't be able to read it. So will they see what I'm getting at? He continued angrily, not taking his eyes off Abalone. Will they see this Saint Germain? He shouted at her. Did we say Saint Germain? Cross it out. Write the Marquis von Belmar. Abalone crossed it out and wrote, but the Count went on speaking so fast that no one could have kept up with him. Splendid man, Belmar. Couldn't stand children, but he took me on his knee, little as I was, and I took it into my head to bite his diamond buttons. That delighted him. He laughed and lifted my head so that we were looking into each other's eyes. You've got excellent teeth, he said. Teeth to tackle anything. But I was looking closely at his eyes. I've traveled around since that time. I've seen all kinds of eyes. But believe me, never again eyes like those. For these eyes to see anything, it needn't be there. It was already within him. You've heard of Venice. Good, I tell you. Those eyes would have brought Venice into this room, and Venice would have been here, just as this desk is here. I was once sitting in the corner listening as he told my father about Persia. Sometimes I think my hands still carry the smell of it. My father held him in high esteem, and his highness, the Landgrave, was something along the lines of a pupil of his. But there were, of course, plenty of people who took it amiss that he believed in the past only when it was inside him. What they couldn't grasp was that stuff only makes sense if you're born with it. Books are empty, shouted the Count, making a furious gesture at the wall. Blood, that's what matters. It's in there we have to be able to read. This Belmare had wondrous stories in his with remarkable pictures. He could open the book where he wanted. There was always something written there. No page in his blood had been skipped. And from time to time, when he locked himself away and leafed through it on his own, he came to the passages on alchemy and precious stones and colors. Why shouldn't all that have been left in? They're certainly somewhere. This man would have had no trouble living with the truth if he'd been on his own, but it was no small matter being alone with the truth like this, and it would offend his good taste to invite people to visit him on account of his truth. He didn't want his lady to be an object of gossip. He was far too much an Oriental in that regard. Adieu, madame, he said truthfully, until a different time. Perhaps in a thousand years, one will be stronger and more undisturbed. Your beauty, madame, is only now revealing itself. He said, and it wasn't merely a compliment. And with that off, he went and established his zoo for people to visit, a kind of jardin de acclimation for the larger species of lies which we have never yet seen, and a palm house for exaggerations, and a small, well-tended fig grove of false secrets. People came from all around, and he strolled about with diamond buckles on his shoes and was totally at the service of his guests. A shallow existence. How? Basically, it was a token of chivalry for his lady, as well as being a boon for his lengthening years. For a while, the old gentleman had nothing more to say to Abalone, whom he had forgotten. He paced madly back and forth and cast challenging glances at Sten, as if Sten at any given moment would transform himself into the man he was thinking of. But Sten was not going to transform himself yet. He had to be seen, the Count persisted crazily. Time was when he was perfectly visible, although in many towns and cities the letters he received were addressed to no one, they just had the name of the place on them, nothing else. But I saw him. He wasn't handsome. The Count gave a peculiar, hurried laugh. <laughs> he wasn't even what people called distinguished or refined. There were always more refined-looking men around him. He was rich. 
but to him it was simply a sort of notion that couldn't be relied on. He was well built, although other men looked after themselves better. In those days, of course, I couldn't judge whether or not he was intellectually stimulating or this or that, which showed him to be a man of worthy qualities, but he was. The Count, trembling, stood there and made a movement as if he were positioning something in space and leaving it there. At this point, he became aware of Abalone. Do you see him? He barked at her, and suddenly he seized one of the silver candlesticks and shone it blindingly in her face. Abalone remembered she'd seen him. Over the next few days, Abalone was summoned regularly, and the dictation after the incident went on much more smoothly. Drawing from all kinds of documents, the Count was compiling his earliest memories of the Bernstorff circle in which his father had played a certain role. Abalone was now so accustomed to the peculiarities of her work that those who saw them working could easily take their purposeful collaboration for a genuine closeness. Once, as Abalone was about to leave, the old gentleman walked up to her, and it was as if he were holding a surprise behind his back. Tomorrow, we'll write about Julie Reventlow, he said, and, savoring his words, added, she was a saint. Presumably, Abalone looked at him in disbelief. Yes, yes, there's still all that, he insisted, as if issuing an order. There's all that, Countess Abel. He took hold of Abalone's hands and opened them like a book. She had the stigmata, he said, here and here. He gave a hard, sharp tap on each palm. Abalone didn't know the term stigmata. It'll become clear, she thought. She was very impatient to hear about the saint whom her father had actually seen, but she wasn't sent for again, not on the next morning nor later. Countess Raventlow was often spoken of in your family, Abalone concluded tersely when I asked her to tell me more. She looked tired. She also claimed to have forgotten most of it. But sometimes I still feel the two marks, she said with a smile, and she couldn't stop smiling as she looked almost with curiosity into her empty hands. This has been an excerpt from The Notebooks of Malt Lorid's Brig by Rainier Marie Rilke, narrated by Joseph Vobel.